another edition of the UK Law Weekly podcast with me, your host, Marcus Cleaver. This week, we're going to be looking at the case of MacDonald and Newton or MacDonald. And the citation for this case is 2017 UKSC 52. The case we're going to be looking at today has a potentially huge impact on pension rights in Scottish divorce cases. Mr MacDonald used to work as a miner for British Coal and joined its superannuation scheme back in late 1978. Fast forward seven years and he married Mrs MacDonald, but then retired shortly afterwards on grounds of ill health. As part of this decision, he elected to receive a pension before his normal retirement age. Thus, while Mr MacDonald was a member and contributor to the scheme between 1978 and 1985, after that point he was a member who received benefits from the scheme, and this distinction is important for the case. The question is what proportion of the pension is a part of the matrimonial property when the couple got divorced in 2010? We can start by looking at the Family Law Scotland Act 1985 that defines matrimonial property as the proportion of any benefits, including pensions, that relate to the period when two people were married. We can delve into this in a little bit more detail by examining the Divorce Etc. Pensions Scotland Regulations 2000 that actually gives a specific formula that can be used. According to Regulation 4, we take the total value of the pension, which is here about £175,000, and multiply that by the period of time during the marriage that the person was a member. The dispute is about what constitutes membership, and the definition that is applied has a huge impact in the context of this case. On the one hand, Mr MacDonald argues that he was only an active member of the scheme when he was actually contributing to it, and so as a proportion of his marriage, this is not even five months. On the other hand, Mrs MacDonald argues that her husband has been a member since 1978 and his membership isn't affected by whether he was paying into the scheme or taking money out. This would mean that he was a member for the entire duration of the marriage. To put this in practical terms, on Mr MacDonald's definition, the matrimonial property would be £10,002, while under Mrs MacDonald's definition, it would actually be £138,534. Thus the Supreme Court had to provide the correct definition of membership of a pension scheme. In the end they sided with Mrs MacDonald and in a unanimous decision the judges explained why the definition of membership should not be confined to the period of active membership when a person was actually contributing to a scheme. Firstly, the Supreme Court was not prepared to add words into the regulations that are not there, Elsewhere in the instrument, reference is made to the different types of membership, and so it's fairly safe to assume that if the drafter had meant active membership, then they would have said so. Secondly, the 2000 regulations apply to both occupational and personal pension schemes, yet the concept of active membership that derives from the Pensions Act 1995 makes no sense in the context of personal pension schemes, where a person may only make occasional contributions and so defining an end to active membership would be very difficult. Thirdly, it is not correct to read the concept of active membership into the regulations on the basis that the general approach to most matrimonial property focuses on the acquisition of assets during the marriage. Pensions are not like most other other property, and this is reflected in the Family Law Scotland Act 1985, where there is a distinct and separate provision that deals with pensions within Section 10. Finally, the justices dealt with an argument put forward by Mr MacDonald's lawyers that the regulations must relate to active membership, otherwise the legislation does not make sense when it states that it is possible for the time of the marriage spent within the pension scheme to potentially equal zero. However, creating such an assumption about the intention of the drafter on this basis is clearly too much of a stretch. Furthermore, this would create a disconnect between the value of the rights acquired before and during the marriage. At the very end of the judgement, a very important caveat is added in that no decision is being made as to a final award between the parties. Indeed, in this regard, the 1985 Act does offer a degree of flexibility based on the context and circumstances unique to a particular situation. Overall, this case put the Supreme Court in a difficult position, 
Between the two definitions put forward by the parties, there was no real middle ground and so they had to make a decision that would either operate harshly against Mr or Mrs MacDonald. While in the end they came down in favour of Mrs MacDonald, they were able to create some equilibrium by making sure that their judgement was framed correctly. After all, the effect of the regulations is only to establish the extent of the matrimonial property. It does not decide how it should be split. This is ultimately for the lower courts, and while the starting point is 50-50, there is scope for allowances to be made in favour of Mr MacDonald, if they consider this to be appropriate. In fact, we have just mentioned this in relation to sections 9-1 and 10-1 of the Family Law Scotland Act 1985. Nevertheless, this should not undermine the importance of this case, or the victory that it represents for Mrs MacDonald. Even if her final award is significantly diminished, it is still likely to be much more than the proposed £10,000 that Mr MacDonald argued was the entirety of the matrimonial property. While future cases will most likely not have such wide divergence in terms of the sums at stake, MacDonald and MacDonald has far-reaching consequences for divorce settlements in Scotland. Many will regard the decision as unfair because assets that were acquired before a marriage are all of a sudden up for grabs. But the reality is that increasing the size of the matrimonial property simply gives the courts better scope and flexibility to come to a fair and just arrangement for both parties. Well, thank you very much for tuning into this episode of the UK Law Weekly podcast. Thanks as ever to bensound.com who provide the theme music. And also a shout out to everyone who's uh, taken the opportunity to leave a rating and a review on iTunes. That is very much appreciated. If you want to get in touch or find out more, you can go to uklawweekly.com or check out my YouTube videos at youtube.com forward slash Marcus Cleaver. I'll be back next week with another case, but in the meantime, bye!